Good morning again. Uh, I think next week I might come in here just to introduce Mike for fun. Uh, so last week I introduced Sam. Uh, this week I am introducing uh, our guest speaker, Roger Woods. Uh, Roger is recently retired um, after being the minister at Wald Lake Church of Christ for, I believe it was over 20 years? 25. Um, <clears throat> so we look forward uh, to hearing from him uh, and what he has to share with us. So, uh, Roger, if you'll uh, come on up here. Uh, and real quickly, I just want to say a prayer. Uh, All right, please. And then you can take us away. Uh, dear God, thank you for this day. Uh, thank you for allowing Roger to come uh, and speak to us this morning. I ask that uh, as, he is, as he is teaching, um, that you open our ears uh, and our hearts to, to hear what he has to say to us. And that you allow us to accept those things uh, and apply them uh, to our lives as we go out from here. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everybody. It's so good to see each one of you. You know, the Lord's body is amazing, the interconnectedness of it. Uh, there are those here today who I am connected with through people who have, um, uh, I knew many, many years ago, but there was a mutuality there. Uh, others I met because, you know, this one lady came to church in Dearborn and and she said, you know, my dad preached here, and I just want to see the house where we lived in. You should have seen Glenda's face when she realized the house wasn't in the best shape. But we let Diane come on over anyway <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and see the house that she lived in when her dad preached there. Um, I can go on with the many bonds that are just represented in you being here. Oh, I, I was going to mention these people that used to live down the street from us in Walled Lake, but, you know, I don't want it to go to Norm's head, all right. Uh, so, <laughs> Julie, she's great. No, no in any case. Um, so many connections, and that is the beauty of the bond uh, that we have in Christ, the beauty that we have as a family of God, that even though we might meet in separate locations on Sunday morning, we're still all about our Father's business. And so, uh, thank you for the way you go about your father's business here. Uh, you are praising God, you are honoring him, and you are lifting up our Savior uh, in this community and in the communities that you live in, and that is what we're all about. I really appreciate Ryan uh, singing Family of God, uh, because today I'm going to be talking about family, but not in a direct sense, but more of an indirect sense in the sense of how we as a family of God should treat one another and one of the very important aspects of that. I do want to encourage you to have your Bibles ready because uh, we're not going to have any PowerPoint. So if you're going to read along with me, you're going to have to have your Bibles out. Sorry. <laughs> because Diane read the first six verses this morning. But... I really want us to have the entire chapter, especially verse 7, in mind as we go through the sermon today. Craig Larson borrows from the computer world by describing Christians who live grace-filled lives before God and other people. And he uses the term from the computer world, beta. Uh, if you're not familiar with a beta site, a beta site is a site that's open to the public to use, but it's still kind of not finished. It's under development. For years, Google called their Gmail, uh, Gmail a beta site. Uh, it was always in development. Notice they've kind of stopped that now. Uh, but the idea with a beta site is it's, it's, being, it's being tested. It's, it's, it's available for comment uh, by the public so that they can understand and make it better. So if you find a problem in a beta site, you don't complain and say, why don't they get their act together? You realize they don't have their act together, and they're developing this thing. So you see a problem, a, a link that doesn't quite work with another website, and you, you write the editor of the, of the site, and you say, hey, look, I had this problem. Can you work on it? And if you're a mature person, that's exactly what you do. You don't get angry. You just... Work with the site because you understand that this is a grace-expected site. They're counting on you to give them grace and to help them become better. 
Nick Carson writes this, applying this idea to Christianity and to the Christian life. We will be more like Christ, he writes, if we treat the people we live and work with every day as beta Christians. Like us, they are all a work in progress. They all need grace. None of them is perfect yet. We should go through every day expecting we will need and need to give grace to others all day long. You know, many of us come into this chapter in Ephesians and we read through verse 6 and we kind of stop there, don't we? That's our traditional way of handling this chapter. Uh, and we start getting into uh, time focusing on what exactly is the one body, spirit, hope, call, faith, Lord, baptism, God and Father. We want to know all those things and we want to define them. We spend a lot of time talking about how we can achieve this unity. And quite frankly, we miss the obvious answer because we stop at verse 6. We don't go on and read verse 7. What does verse 7 say? But each one of us, or to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ portioned it. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that unity in the body of Christ is unimportant. Okay? It is. The Lord himself in John 17 gave the high priestly prayer. And what did he pray for in that prayer? That they may be one, as you and I, Father, are one. We should always be seeking to be united as believers in Christ. We should always be seeking ways to heal the rifts that have grown in the body of Christ. Amen? And let's, we have to face it. There are divisions among us. Just as we see in our society, we see in our churches as well. But if we try to unite the body of Christ without understanding that God has already provided the means for unity, then we will tear asunder rather than heal and make whole. Because we try to supply a uniting factor that God has not really sanctioned. To each of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. Anne Lamont's definition of grace makes you stop and take a moment. Yes, the famous fiction author, Anne Lamont. She writes, grace means you're in a different universe from where you had been stuck, when you had absolutely no way to get there on your own. Let me re repeat that. Grace means you're in a different universe from where you had been stuck when you had absolutely no way to get there on your own. You know, that describes my, my experience in life. Uh, having just retired, I like to say rewired because I'm still working. I'm working now as a hospice chaplain. But I've done a lot of reflecting. Uh, and I've looked back at different experiences that I had uh, this past fall, I was at a uh, reunion of a college that I went to in Pennsylvania, from which I transferred to, to Pepperdine. And uh, I started thinking about that whole time in my life and, and what I experienced and, and how blessed I was. And it strikes me how much grace was extended to me during that time. During that time when I had no way of knowing how I was going to do it, and yet somehow the Lord provided for me. For instance, when I arrived at Pepperdine University at the end of the summer of 1981, I had no financial aid. Yes, you heard that right. I had no financial aid. But God's grace was already at work before I ever arrived. My dad's company gave him a temporary transfer to Oxnard, California, 30 minutes from the campus, by the way. They paid to move us as a family across country from New Jersey to California. Therefore, I got to bring my car along. The first night we went to church in Oxnard, California, at the Oxnard Church of Christ, we met Bob Fraley, the Dean of Admissions. I introduced myself and he said, yeah, I know your name, you don't have any money. He said, be on campus tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. I was there early. And God bless Bob. He took me by the hand, 
and walked me from department to department trying to find money. Then he made a phone call and he said, I want you to meet with one of the elders for the Malibu Church of Christ. They might have an opening for their campus ministry program. And so I met with one elder, then I met with the next elder, who happened to be the president of the university, Dr. Howard White. Let's just wrap this up and say, in the space of two days, I went from an unknown transfer student to a member of the ministry staff of the Malibu Church of Christ as an assistant campus minister, which paid my entire tuition, by the way. And I went from being in a triple dorm room to being in a two-bedroom apartment by the beach. Literally on the beach, okay? God's grace. That's only an example. But God's grace is the only explanation for how that happened. Because I did not do any extra effort to make sure I had all the money I needed to go to Pepperdine. I was late putting my application in. That's why I had no financial aid. And yet God took care of it. I was given that grace, though, for a reason. And that reason was to prepare me for service to God and to his people. And I am, I am so grateful for that as I look back. I came across this quote in a commentary. If one is saved by grace, then it must be true also that one is prepared to serve by grace. Grace is the glue that holds all this together. It is what keeps us united. Now, as I served there at the Pepperdine in that position, I had plenty of opportunities to serve and to have uh, my faith, faith tested, to have my skills developed. But all that started way before I got to Pepperdine. I had parents who modeled gracious service to others. And through their example and through their, should I say, volunteering me to serve, you know how that goes, parents, um, I was more than prepared for the campus ministry position, more prepared than I had a right to be. You know, too often we take the attitude that Paul seeks to correct in Romans 6. We think that, you know, we need to just admit that we're sinners and that we can do nothing about it and just keep sinning and let God's grace just increase and fill in the hole. Well, it doesn't work that way, amen? Paul says it too, doesn't he? He says, by no means is that the way God wants us to live. He says instead we are to look at ourselves as being freed from sin, therefore we can Live for God. That's what it's all about. Bradley Nassif puts it well when he writes, Grace is opposed to merit, but it is not opposed to effort. We can put in the effort. Matter of fact, we need to put in the effort, especially when it comes to how we deal with one another as the family of Christ. Remember what Jesus said would be the sign of his, uh, that you are his disciple to the world? Was it the way you, uh, you know, sang the right songs or said the prayers in exactly the right way? It wasn't, was it? What was it? They will know you're my disciples by the love you have for one another, by the way you graciously live with one another. God, through his grace, did you catch that there in Ephesians 4? God, through his grace, has distributed gifts to each of us. And the purpose of these gifts of grace is to bring about the unity that we read about in verses 1 through 6 of Ephesians 4. They were given to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ might be built up until we all reach uni unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. We cannot, through our own merit, earn salvation. Nor can we, through our merit, be that uh, <clears throat> brilliant rhetoric, uh, keen knowledge, or flawless 
practice unite the body of Christ. Our merit, our effort can't do it. But if we, while relying on God's grace, spend ourselves in selfless service, then the body of Christ is built up. And the rifts that tear her apart can be healed. Together, and by his grace, we can do more than we can ask or imagine. We need to catch that vision that Paul tried to instill in the church. And that is really a a vision that is the original vision, what was intended by the Lord all along. Not that we get everything perfect, but that we let grace be what fills us up and fills in those places where we lack. And when we do this, when we lead this way, and in a family situation, we can't ignore the generational differences. You know, I was going to tell some stories on the boy's dad from about 20 years ago. Yeah, it's, it's a good one, but I'll tell you later. <laughs> um, he can romp with a puppy. I'll just put it that way. Uh, and they're going, yeah, that's our dad. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, but there's a generational thing going on here in church, isn't there? And isn't that wonderful? But older generation, we've got to model gracious living to the younger generation. Or you know what they'll pick up on? Yeah, what we don't want them to see. We need to make it something that is is just a part of ourselves. It's part of what it means to make disciples of Jesus Christ. We've got to pour ourselves out into them. So, all the Christians, let me ask you a little bit of a difficult question. When was the last time that you directly encouraged a younger Christian around you? Where you directly came to them and said, I see this in you and I want to encourage you with this. It needs to be that direct, folks. You can't say, oh, well, you know, they know that I I like them. They know that I think they're a good person. No, they need to hear it. They need to see it. Just as I was empowered by God through the lives of others. And my Pepperdine story is just one of many that I could have told about how the generations have blessed me. Uh, This next generation won't be blessed, folks, unless we do it, unless we take the opportunity. This is the high school graduation senior season, right? How many in this congregation are graduating? We've got a few graduates here this year. Um, We only have two this year uh, at Wald Lake, Um, but it's, it's that season. You know, everybody's going to their nieces and nephews and grandkids' graduations, you know, there for them, and it's a wonderful thing. But what are we giving them beyond an education in facts to go into life and be able to really excel? Uh, They're getting ready to go out into that wider, and I like to say wilder world that's out there. And they're going to come out of the lee of the shelter of their families into the storms of life. They will be tempted to prove themselves or worse, fool themselves into thinking that they can do it all by themselves. You and I know that that's just not possible. But they face the choice anyway, to do it on their own, or they can choose another way, if we will model it to them, to choose to follow the Lord's plan. In church, we are the part of that plan. That they don't have to walk that road alone, that they have a band of brothers and sisters, a family that walks with them as they go. A family that, even when they fall down, is going to show them grace so that they can stand up again. We need to share with them how by God's grace we have been saved and we have been helped. And we need to repeat those family stories as we sit at the dinner table, as we sit around the campfire, as we sit around the potluck tables at church. Let's tell these stories. Tell them our failures, yeah. But also tell them our victories. Emphasize the role that God played in each of these. If they will accept the love and grace of God in Christ Jesus, they will be blessed. That's the kind of stories we need to be sharing. By the grace of God, In Christ Jesus, through his spirit, we have been given gifts. Not so that we can 
just hand them back to him later undone but so that we can hand them back to him multiplied because we have shared them with others and because we have shared them with others we have helped others navigate the storms of life navigate their own frailties and failures and understood the love of God for them church the greatest gift God has given you besides salvation is sitting all around you this morning it's your church family it was he Paul wrote who gave some to be apostles some to be prophets some to be evangelists and some to be pastors and teachers why to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be lifted up each of you is a vital part of this spiritual family and God is doing great things through each of you I want to encourage you to trust his grace trust his gifts and you will see greater opportunities in life greater blessings as well would you bow with me in prayer holy God who has called us together here this morning in the name of Jesus Christ and given us gifts of grace that unite us to you and to one another. Father, today I pray that you will be with each of your children present here today. Help them to live grace-filled lives as beta Christians, being humble, gentle, and patiently bearing with one another. Show us, Father, the beauty of your one body church make clear to us the gifts of grace you have endowed in each of us help us to spend our lives in your service using these graces to bless and to be blessed help us father to become mature in the faith and the knowledge of your son so that we will obtain his fullness not by our own merit lord but by your grace Shelter us in the lee of your hands so that we are not tossed about and shipwrecked by the deceitful scheming of sinful men or our own pride. Help us instead, Father, to grow into him who is our head, that is Christ. May we see how together with all the whole church we are the body of Christ. And that true fulfillment is found only as we answer your call by laying our gifts down at your feet. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You go through this Memorial Day weekend and as you continue to serve God by His grace each and every day. Let's stand and sing.